The moose has lost part of his kingdom. The invader has pushed him farther north. Almost two billion years before the first ancestor of our moose roamed the area, the earth began to hoard in a great sea, material which in the latter half of the 20th century is to become the source of almost unlimited power. A small part of this sea we now know as the Algoma district of Ontario. Geologists tell us that through countless years, radioactive material was laid down under the water in the sea, along with sand, clay, and quartz pebbles, to form a quartz pebble conglomerate. This uranium-bearing conglomerate was covered by sand, clay, and gravel, which formed a protective coating. In a later epoch, something like this happened. Just as a card will buckle upward when pressure is exerted on its edges, so with the passing of ages, changes in the Earth's crust brought great pressure to bear on the edges of the trough of the sea so that the bottom was heaved upward and was slightly tilted. In places, its content of radioactive material was brought close to the surface. A long period of erosion followed the folding and tilting action and resulted in the present exposure of the uranium-bearing conglomerate, roughly in the form of a giant letter Z. All these geological changes set the framework for the development to follow. Geiger counter in a government mining office more than 100 miles from the site started the development of the fabulous Blind River uranium area. This area was to become one of the most ambitious, the most concentrated mining enterprises of all time. Long Township a reference to the rock sample's place of origin offered a clue, but only a clue, because Long Township, near the town of Blind River, represented 36 square miles of heavily wooded and extremely rugged terrain. No needle was ever better hidden in a haystack than was the exact source of that one piece of conglomerate in such an expanse of forest, rock, and muskeg. Associate Carl Gunterman, Amy Breton eventually succeeded in finding the actual test pit from which presumably the mystery sample had come. No time was lost in staking additional claims in the surrounding area, and efforts were made to find a buyer. Engineers and geologists were brought to the scene to substantiate the prospector's findings. All were faced with the same enigma. Although Geiger counters and other geophysical instruments reacted violently, indicating the presence of radioactive mineral over a wide area, assays of samples taken from near the surface revealed only a trace of such constituents. The next few years brought only discouragement. Most of the geologists and engineers who entered the field with high hope retired in discouragement when no mineral values were found. Claims which were staked lapsed. However, one individual, Frank Jubin, a prospector geologist who had viewed the discovery in 1949, refused to admit that the baffling problem could not be solved. Struck by the similarity between Blind River conglomerates and those of the famous Whitwater's Rand in South Africa, 
he and his associates came up with a theory to explain the paradox of radioactive rock, which lacked any radioactive element. Finally, they staked 36 claims covering 1,440 acres in the area in which they were interested. Then they undertook a diamond drilling program that confirmed their wildest hopes. Drill cores brought up from some depth had a worthwhile uranium content thus indicating that the uranium content of the rock at the surface had been leached out and lost during the centuries of exposure to the elements. But down below, it was still intact. Prior to the year 1925, an early geological map by W.H. Collins of the Geological Survey of Canada had been made of the sediments in the area and a contact traced for some 80 miles in length. This contact, which formed the division between the old rocks in the area and the younger sediments, extended in the shape of a roughly formed Z from the shore of Lake Huron in a northwestward direction. This early report and geological map were studied and the final deductions resulted in the group making plans to stake claims along this structure. If their belief was tenable, this group would have within their grasp one of the most prodigious mining empires ever established. <laughs> Certainly the one proved discovery and the vastly greater prize they hoped for were far too great to permit the employment of the normal, easy-going prospecting techniques. Speedy action had to be taken secretly and on a much larger scale than had ever been tried before. Strategy was planned as carefully as that of a military campaign. Enough experienced prospectors to cover all the ground were needed. These frontline troops were men thoroughly versed in prospecting and staking procedures. Men who must be closed mouthed for the utmost secrecy had to be maintained. Necessary mining licenses for the prospectors were obtained from several of the mining recorders' offices throughout Ontario. With well-laid plans, these men set out on their assault on a campaign that later became known as the Backdoor Staking Bee. Plane load by plane load, the men were flown in from the north in complete secrecy. Finally, on July 9th, 1953, the mission accomplished signal was given and the prospectors moved out of the bush to converge on the recorder's offices where they filed title to more than 1,400 claims totaling 56,000 acres. When the news broke and the secret was out, a major rush started and the invading prospectors staked an additional 8,000 claims in the most promising parts of the area left open. All this activity, compressed into a period of a few weeks, was only the forerunner of the still more feverish activity that was to follow. Scores of diamond drilling rigs and their crews were flown into the area. Hundreds of holes were driven into the earth. The staked ground had to be proven for its mineral worth. As the end result of all this probing, the mine finders were able to compile a mosaic of the Earth's crust almost as accurately as though they had subjected it to the eye of a gigantic X-ray machine. Drill cores were assayed and subjected to the most minute scrutiny. The real richness of the uranium became apparent in the middle and north arms of the Big Z. at the extreme south end was not overlooked, however, and a full-scale mining enterprise was established there. 
On a site a few hundred yards from the main highway, the Pronto Mine broke ground for a mine and mill. Nearly every time record known to the mining industry was broken in getting the wheels of the mill turning after the decision to go ahead was taken. It served as a pilot plant for the others that were to follow. In the middle and north arms of the Zed, within a radius of a very few miles, plans for 10 separate mills were drawn up. The smallest of them would dwarf any other uranium mining enterprise in the Western Hemisphere. Vast quantities of supplies had to be brought in to sink the mine shafts, to construct buildings, to house and feed the workers, and to build and equip the mills. There were no roads into this rugged bush country. Old tote roads were useless. The 30 odd miles that separated the most distant of these mines from the highway presented a real problem. Aeroplanes alone could not handle the necessary supplies for this huge development. A road, almost any kind of road, became an urgent necessity. In January 1954, following the line of least resistance, a road was started northward. Mile after tortuous mile, the road was cut over rock and muskeg. Thousands of yards of fill were bulldozed and dumped into muskeg and over rock. Speed was all essential. In three months, the road reached Quirk and was in use. Much additional labor was required to make the road passable for all weather traffic, and finally, late in 1955, the Ontario Department of Highways took on the job of building a permanent highway to carry the thousands of men and millions of tons of supplies needed to build up the world's greatest uranium development. In this area, more money was to be expended for labor and materials over a short period of time than at any other spot and on any project of its kind in the entire world. Accommodation for mine staffs, engineers, construction workers, and miners had to be provided. Residential sites were planned close to the mines for the executive staffs. This was deluxe pioneering for the worker and his family. Trailer campsites were laid out with water, electricity, and sewage facilities provided. A new town site was carefully engineered and subdivided for business blocks, residences, schools, and community centers. So from a spot in the bush, the town of Elliott Lake had its beginning. a new town with wide avenues, with paved roads, and substantially constructed permanent buildings to replace all the temporary structures. It will have every amenity that older towns can offer, and more besides. Because of the urgent demand by government and industry for uranium, engineering was speeded as never before by staffs of young, virile engineers who had the know-how. Men who could figure the way around, the way over, or the way through. The work on mine shafts and mills was started simultaneously. the development started north along the Big Z. Camps for construction workers were built and sites for trailer camps and residential areas were laid out. The Buckles Mine pushed down a shaft into the ore body and started to stockpile the ore. Within a stone's throw, Algom Nordic were shaft sinking and building a mill to handle 3,000 tons of ore daily. Here again, records were being broken in shaft sinking and mill building. To 
To the north and east of the Elliott Lake town site, the Stan Lee mine started sinking into a large ore body 3,500 feet below the surface. Two shafts went down simultaneously. Foundations for the 3,000-ton mill to handle Stan Lee's ore were being laid on solid rock close to the shafts. Construction crews built temporary living quarters for workers, storehouses, and workshops. Although all this activity was started some months later than that of the neighboring developments, work shot ahead with the speed of the last horse leaving the starting gate. In the middle of one branch of the Big Zed, Millican Lake Mine on a large flat plateau started sinking two shafts which were to reach ore at the 3,200-foot level and supply a 3,000-ton mill. To the east of Millican, the third mine on the same structure, Lake Nordic Uranium Mine, following the same pattern as its neighbors, was shaft sinking and mill building. The shafts were going down to the more shallow dip of the ore body to 1,900 feet to mine the ore, and a 4,000-ton mill was being built to process it. To the north of this activity, and on the shore of Quirk Lake, near the north tip of the Big Zed, is Consolidated Denison. Denison started pushing down a seven-compartment shaft to a comparative flat ore body, 2,400 feet down. A second shaft, a quarter of a mile away, is connected through the ore body to this production shaft. The mill, with the capacity to handle up to 6,000 tons per day, is the largest mill devoted exclusively to the production of uranium in the world. Denison's comparatively little brother, the 2,500-ton Cammet mine and mill also lies on the shore of Quirk Lake and on the same geological structure. Two shafts on the shoreline down 1,700 feet will deliver ore to the mill on the higher ground. Overlooking the lake on the crest of a high promontory is the Stanrock uranium property. The head frame of its 3,500-foot shaft looks like a lighthouse against the distant horizon. Stanrock's mill is designed to handle 3,000 tons daily. Spanish-American, its two shafts and mill, driving for the day when all would be completed and 2,000 tons of ore would be going through the milling processes. Unique among its neighbors, Panel, with two shafts on offshore islands, one connected by a man-made causeway, presents a rare picture against the blue waters of Quirk Lake. From 1,700 feet below the surface of the lake, the ore will be brought up, crushed, and conveyed to a 3,000-ton mill on the rocky lake shore. Algom Quirk, the outpost development on the north end of the Big Set, was the jumping off place for the original mine finders and the first mill in the basin area to get into production. The mill has a daily capacity of 3,000 tons. This is one of the four mines in the district where conventional track mining methods are employed. The largest uranium producer along the Big Zed is the North Span Company, consisting of Panel, Spanish American, Buckles, and Lake Nordic, all these under the management of the Rio Tinto Mining Company of Canada, in whose group Pronto, Millican Lake, Algom Nordic, 
and Algon Quirk mines are prominent. As speed was a factor in developing the Elliott Lake uranium area, temporary head frames were erected and the shaft sinking crews went to work determined as never before to beat time to get to a prescribed depth. The shaft sinker, who considers himself the aristocrat among hard rock miners, was into the same old hard rock, but after a different mineral. Hundreds of acres of muskeg, bush, and rock were being cleared to make room for the huge mills. Design depended on the lay of the land. Some mines were more fortunate than others, but all overcame any obstruction that lay in their paths. To support the great weight of milling machinery, solution tanks and buildings, nearly all foundations were laid on solid rock. Day and night, drilling and blasting went on. Hundreds of men representing every division of the building trades were erecting mills. Nearly every type of machine known to the construction industry was being used to speed the work along. Day and night, carpenters were setting forms for the cement men who followed. Then came the steel men who erected the great steel skeletons for permanent head frames, ore bins and buildings. 24 hours a day through fair weather and foul, these builders toiled. Construction engineers and draftsmen kept ahead of the builders, carefully planning the next move. Mechanical and metallurgical engineers were busy specifying each type of machine required or designing a new machine to fit a particular job. All those men were specialists in the building of uranium plants and in the processing of uranium ore. And so when shafts had gone to their required depth, underground mining started. Running over a wide area in the Elliott Lake District, huge tonnages of comparatively flat-lying uranium ore of fairly uniform thickness and moderate dip were found by diamond drilling. The dip and extent of the ore body determined where the shafts were sunk. Some were a few hundred feet deep, others a few thousand. Where the dip was steep, running from or near the surface to a considerable depth, the conventional type of track mining was employed. Where the ore body had only a slight dip, trackless mining methods were used. As only a few of the metallic mineral deposits in Canada had the type of geological formation found in the Elliott Lake District, engineers studied and introduced many new types of mechanization for handling large tonnages. Much time and experience goes into planning the underground workings of a mine, for it has characteristics similar to a large city skyscraper. The mining method common to most of the uranium mines is the room and pillar method of mining. The hard rock in the Elliott Lake area is drilled by lightweight air leg drills, which provide great mobility and are time-saving. The technology of modern mining has made rapid strides in time and labor-saving equipment. The ever-increasing costs for labor and materials have necessitated the introduction of new mining methods and techniques. Lightweight drills open up the areas to be followed by the drilling workhorse of these mines. The big mobile jumbo drilling machine mounted on crawler treads or heavy rubber tires. Two or four drill booms are mounted on the carriage. These booms can then move the drills to suit the drilling pattern required and can all operate simultaneously. Two men usually are assigned to operate each drill mobile. A complete round is drilled each shift. And while loading and blasting goes on, the drill mobile moves under its own power to another location. And so, hour by hour, 24 hours a day, drilling goes on. Dynamite men then load the drill holes with the long yellow sticks of explosive to blast the ore.
following blasting, the loose rock on the sides and overhead is scaled off. As a protection for the miner, the roof of the drift is rock bolted. Blasted rock is moved by several types of loaders and carriers suited to trackless mining. Machines for this purpose are adapted to the flat-lying uranium ore deposits. These mobile units are designed to handle large volumes with a minimum of operating manpower. Where space is limited, the smaller mobile overhead loader on crawler tracks is used. Small but mighty, it can tear into a pile of muck and keep the ore carriers busy. Shuttle cars are the transport trucks in the mine, fast and easy to manipulate, mounted on heavy rubber tires. Operated by one man, they can carry over 15 tons of muck and unload with ease. The bottom of these shuttle cars consists of a flight conveyor, which shifts the load to the front when loading and again when unloading at the ore chute. The larger mobile mechanical loader, mounted on crawler tracks, pushes a flat plate into the muck. Two gathering arms mounted on this flat plate scrape the muck into a continuous conveyor running the length of the loader, which dumps the muck into the shuttle car. Designed to handle volume tonnage and operated by one man, this rugged machine can keep a small fleet of these shuttle cars busy. in the Elliott Lake District, due to a steep dip in the ore body, employ conventional equipment for track haulage. Stokes running off from the drifts are drilled by the lighter air leg drills, and when blasted out, the muck is pulled over to the ore passes by slushers and is collected in ore pockets at the drift. The ore cars are filled at these ore pockets and hauled out to the dumping stations. Here, the cars of ore go over a ramp which dumps each car. The muck goes down a collection raise to the crusher at the lower level. Someone had to discover the method of milling the uranium ore of the district. But once discovered, the practice of extracting uranium from rock became a straightforward chemical operation. The ore, after being crushed in the mine, is raised to the surface ore bin. From there, it is again subjected to crushing. It is then screened. The coarse rock is returned for further crushing, and the fines go to the ball and rod mills, where they are ground in water to the consistency of fine flour. Resulting slurry goes through classifiers. The liquid carrying the very fine particles in suspension goes through a series of disc filters. gigantic acid tanks for leaching where the uranium is exposed to sulfuric acid solutions. It is filtered and re-filtered to recover the dissolved uranium. In the process, an ingenious automatic electrically controlled apparatus, the ion exchange, separates the various components, producing a purified uranium solution. The uranium now begins to take form. It is still a liquid with the uranium in solution and again goes through precipitating tanks where the liquid is reduced to a thick slurry. It goes over a series of revolving filters and is scraped off to go into the drying department. 
Here it is again filtered to get out more moisture and to the drying oven where most of the remaining moisture is taken out and the final concentrate, a salt containing a high percentage of uranium oxide, is pressed into small dried pellets, barreled in steel drums and shipped to the refinery for its final processing. Contrary to the commonly held belief, uranium is not one of the world's really rare minerals. It is found in minute quantities in many parts of the Earth's rocky crust. But only occasionally is it so concentrated that it can be recovered economically. And nowhere in the free world has there been discovered such large bodies of this energy-giving material as that which we have seen being developed in the Elliott Lake area of Ontario. Beneath the surface, hidden deep in the rocks of the Big Z, is the source of more than enough energy to supply all the predictable needs of Canada. There is enough not only to meet domestic needs, but to supply Canada's friends and neighbors as well. Uranium, the power of tomorrow.